in a way, um, there we go, good morning. Uh, I've been away for a long time, it feels like. I had a brief vacation at the end of my term and went back to Montana to see my family. Uh, and then I had uh, two weeks of intensive courses on the computer, and I've just completed my first week back at seminary. So it is so good to be back among you. So we have a few, well, so, uh, Pastor Jenna is away this Sunday. Uh, Pastor Russ Kreit will be presiding today, and I'll be assisting. I'd just like to take a moment to welcome you all to Christ Lutheran Church, either here in the pews or online at home, where we live in Christ and share his love with all people. We gratefully acknowledge we gather on the ancestral homelands of the Lummi and Coast Salish people, who has stewarded this land since time immemorial, and we commit to the ongoing care of our shared land and relationships with its indigenous people. Several announcements today. I'm going to also ask for all of you for your announcements as well. Um, the first is, as I know last week we um, blessed and gave a sending for Sumi, but I would also like to introduce uh, Emily Perry, Sumi's uh, next, the, the person who will be taking over for Sami, this is Emily. I'd like to welcome her. We're excited to have you. Uh, there is a family night this Wednesday at the church, and I believe it is taco night. Is that correct? It's, it's in the announcements. Um, but summer family nights begin this Wednesday at 6 p.m., and it is a taco night. Um, dinner at 6, followed by a devotion, games, and a closing prayer. And there is a, a link in the weekly email that you got this week to sign up um, to bring something. So um, in the old days, we would have a paper sign up after church, but many people have already used the link. Um, I'd encourage you to, to sign up that way um, and to see tomorrow if you had any questions. Uh, this coming weekend, there's a sign out in the narthex about um, godly play on the road with pizza this weekend. So if you have any kids or know of any kids who'd like to come, the details are on that sign. And there will be a Stephen minister available during communion today. If you feel you would like prayer, um, you can meet them at the, the back of the church and they will be available for prayer. Also, we found a set of car keys. Um, if, if, you could, I, if you're missing a set of car keys, um, please tell me what they look like, and I have them for you. Um, they were left last Sunday. All right, I think that's it. And are there any other announcements? Come on up. All right, and if you have a minute after church today, um, meet in the fellowship hall to help unbox one section of the table. All right. Thank you, Russ. Are there any birthdays, anniversaries, or baptismal anniversaries today? Yes. Happy, happy birthday. Anyone else? No one's admitting it this week. <laughs> All right, let's sing. Happy birthday. rather than the backs of your heads. And it's, it's one of the privileges that 
you will come to know more and more as being able to see the interesting, wonderful, beautiful, handsome faces of the people that gather in the name of Jesus on Sunday mornings. So, as we're about to begin, we begin in the name of the one God that we know in three of Do you have a microphone on? I did. Can you turn it on? I will try it again. <laughs> so, God's got to wait just... Oh! Hey, Preston. Hey. Uh, there we go. All right. Well, let's try this one again. And... Um, there is one God whom we know in three ways as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this God's love endures forever. And knowing that God is with you and me right now, and God knows you and me just as we are, what we do is we confess that we're not perfect. So we can hear the words from God saying, I know, and I love you anyway. Once we get that out of the way, then we can worship fully, completely, with no baggage. So, would you please rise if you are able and we begin. I'll say it again. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love endures forever. Amen. So let us confess our sins in the presence of God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not followed your path but have chosen our own way. Instead of putting others before ourselves, we long to take the best seats at the table. When met by those in need, we have too often passed by on the other side. Set us again on the path of life. Save us from ourselves and free us to love our neighbors. Amen. Hear the good news. God does not deal with us according to our sins, but delights in granting pardon and mercy. So in the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven, and you are free to love the way God loves. Amen. I say to you that the peace of the Lord is with you always. And also with you. Now, knowing that, that God is here, let's greet each other in the name of the peace of Christ. God's peace. God's peace. And God's peace. And God's peace. Yes, God's peace. Yes. And God's peace. Thank you. God's peace. Did you get that song thing working for God's peace. Yes, yeah, yeah. I was wondering. I saw you there. And I thought, oh, I got, I, you know, I And God's peace. Yeah. And God's peace. When you say our first hymn, will you come and follow me?
from God, ruler of all hearts, you call us to obey you, and you favor us with true freedom. Be us faithful to the ways of your Son, that we may be mine all that hinders us. We may stand constantly following your paths. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. May be seated, we hear the reading of the Lord. First reading is from the 19th chapter of First Kings. Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go, return to, on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael over king, as king over Aram. Also you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shephat, of Abel-Maholah, as prophet in your place. So he set out from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, who was plowing. There were twelve yoke of oxen ahead of him, and he was with the twelfth. Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle over him. He left the oxen, ran after Elijah, and said, Let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. Then Elijah said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? He returned from following him, took the yoke of oxen, and slaughtered them. Using the equipment from the oxen, he boiled their flesh and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out and followed Elijah and became his servant. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please read Psalm 16 responsibly. Protect me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I have said to the Lord, you are my Lord, my good above all other. All the delights do not be better in the land upon those who are noble among the people. But those who run after other gods shall have their troubles multiplied. For when the love of your God and the great God increases to such trust, never take their names above the others. O Lord, you are my portion and my cup. It is you who uphold my lot. My boundaries will close the present time. Indeed, I have a rich inheritance. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. My heart teaches me night after night. I accept the Lord always before me. Because God is at my right hand, but I shall not be shaken. My heart, therefore, is glad, and my spirit rejoices. My body also shall rest in hope. For you will not abandon me to the grave, for I let your holy one see the day. You will show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from the fifth chapter of Galatians. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious, fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I am warning you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, 
joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. The word of the Lord. And he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. But the Samaritans did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from the heavens and consume them? But, he, but Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another, Jesus said, Follow me. But, Jesus, but the man said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. We're out of practice. It's so good to be with you after several weeks away. I had attended vacation. Oh, that is correct. That is correct. You, you all are not the only ones out of practice after being several weeks away. Good morning. How are you doing today? Good? So today's gospel has something to do with people who want to follow Jesus. And that can be confusing about how Jesus wants to follow him. So I thought we would practice a little bit today, if that's okay with you. Would you all follow me for a little bit? Okay. I'll have you stand up. Now, I'm not Jesus, just to, just to warn you. But um, do your best to follow me, and this is going to be ridiculous, so forgive me. Um, we're just going to, I'm going to embarrass myself in front of you guys today. So first, do your best to follow me like this. I'm just going to tiptoe. This is good practice. Think you can do that? Everyone says no. Okay. Okay. So how about we just follow in a normal way over here then? So what is this here? It's a bowl. It's where people get baptized. And the baptismal font is actually the start of our journey where we begin to follow Jesus. When we're baptized, we become members of the church, we become Christians, we become part of God's own family. And from this point on, when that water touches us and we are baptized, even though we're little babies, and I don't remember my baptism, do you remember yours? Yes, you do? A little bit? From that moment on, we become part of God's family, and we are asked to follow Jesus. And we never quite know in our whole lives, especially when we're little babies, our parents help us, and they raise us, and they teach us what it means to be part of God's family. But from that point on, 
at some point, when we begin to pray, when we begin to learn more about God, when we come to church on Sunday, when we come to communion and the Lord's Supper, those are all clues to help us to listen to Jesus a little bit better. And sometimes the voice is very quiet, and sometimes the voice is very confusing. We might hear things that our friends don't like. We may hear things our parents don't like. But when we're listening to Jesus' voice, he says, come, follow me, and I will give you life. And it all started right here at your baptism. And it goes your whole life. Amen. Amen. Okay. Better than having to do some silly walks with me today. Good morning. As I said, many of us are out of practice with the order of the service today. I've been gone almost three weeks and I've missed you and I've been praying for you in my absence and hopefully you've been praying for me as well. I can definitely use your prayers. I won't be presumptuous to ask if you miss me because I might not like some of the answers. Today's gospel asks what it might mean to be a follower of Jesus. What might it mean to be a disciple of Christ? In today's text, we might not like Jesus' answers. The cost might be too high. The gospel can seem too radical. We might be inclined to say, well, that's for the apostles in the Bible. That was a long time ago. Not for me. But what if? What if it wasn't just for the people who lived long ago that saw Jesus face to face? What if he was asking us to do these things too? When I'm faced with such a harsh Jesus, a demanding Messiah, I may find myself not wanting to be a disciple at all. Maybe you, like me, would settle on the idea of being a fan of Jesus rather than a disciple. A hanger on to see what Jesus is going to do next rather than be a saint. I have no interest in being a saint. I have always subscribed to spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. Being a fan of Jesus might be like being a Mariners fan. We watch some games, we have a few t-shirts, we admit they had the start, a bad start to the season, but their players are very young, just like Jesus' apostles when he called them. You might find it mildly embarrassing to be identified as a fan in a crowd of strangers, but it doesn't cost us much. Being a fan gives us a good feeling gives us a sense of being on the team. Team Jesus, go Jesus. Now it's always a good idea when reading the Bible to ask, so what's the situation? What is going on here? What else is happening in the story? We might call this context. Remember, we as Lutherans read the Bible contextually. We don't pluck a verse out and ignore everything that comes around it. As Pastor Jana likes to say, we Lutherans don't use Bible bullets to shoot them back at somebody. That's not what the Bible is for, and that's not what our faith as Christians is for. What is going on with Jesus today? That he suddenly seems to get so cranky and demanding of people who say they want to follow him. Luke 9.51 says, When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face toward Jerusalem. What is drawing near? What does taken up mean? Why is Jesus setting his face toward Jerusalem? You and I already know the end of his story. We know Jesus will go to Jerusalem to be tried, tortured, executed, and buried. We know what is waiting. And with this in mind, we can see what is drawing near the end of Jesus' ministry and his life. We can read to be taken up with this understanding as well. Jesus will be taken up before Pilate. His tortured body will be taken up and crucified on a cross. But we also know that Jesus will be taken up to new life when he rises from the dead. Jesus will be taken up when he ascends to heaven after the resurrection. Make no mistake, we as Christians know our story does not end in a tomb. 
We know that on the other side of death, we will be taken up into new life. It can be so easy to forget that Jesus just isn't calling us to the tomb, to a life of hardship, to a life without joy where we are just bound to serve our neighbor. It can be so easy to forget when we face our losses and difficulties and various kinds of death. We simply decide that the price is too high, that the cost is too great, that we really aren't cut out for the work. Who wants to be a follower of that? Jesus knows what is coming, and he sets his face toward Jerusalem, knowing what it would cost. He made a decision. And then that decision, he reoriented his whole life, literally the path he was traveling to take him towards all that would come. Knowing this, I'm more willing to be a fan of Jesus on most days than a disciple. I would line up along the road saying, go, Jesus, I believe in you. Or, you've got this, Jesus, I'm praying for you. But I don't want to go to Jerusalem. Do you? Jesus makes a decision to walk the walk. This is immediately followed by a Samaritan village that wants nothing to do with Jesus headed to Jerusalem. Now, there was religious tension at the time between Samaria, the home of the Samaritans, and Judea, the home of the Jews and Jerusalem. But the point is, the Samaritans didn't want anything to do with a Jesus, especially if he was going to Jerusalem. They're religious enemies. They didn't need a Messiah who was going to get into all of that. I can definitely see the Samaritan view. No thanks, we dodged a bullet, they think. Maybe we think that too. But sometimes in our lives, we don't have a choice to ignore the hard parts. Sometimes it seems like there's hardly any choice at all. We all have moments where we face loss and we don't know what to do. A medical diagnosis, the end of a relationship, unthinkable tragedy. There are times in our lives where if we decide to face the truth about our life or ourselves, or another person, that we might lose everything. A lie we can no longer keep telling, an addiction, even something like depression where we just can't go on anymore in secret. So involved with the shock, the trauma, the pain, that we feel like Jesus if he goes to Jerusalem. We forget what happens after the crucifixion. We can only see the tomb. There have been places in my own life where I have faced some of the same dilemmas, where facing the truth about myself, about my life, cost me everything I had known and loved. Walking into that truth seemed like a tomb, and I couldn't see life beyond it. For me, one instance was when I realized I was gay and couldn't avoid it any longer. I needed to tell the truth about myself, about who I was, to those closest to me but I also knew that it would cost me the whole world, and it did. Like I have preached before, me coming out was an apocalypse for my family, for my religious faith, for my community. Rural Montana in 1994 could not receive that truth. The church I belonged to had no place for me at the table. My family said they didn't know me because I was not their son, not the person they had raised me to be. My whole life had come before laid in a tomb, and it was lost to me, and I was lost to it. I was lost to the people who had given birth to me, raised me, loved me, and took me to church my entire life. A third of the people in my hometown stopped talking to my family. Colleagues, neighbors, longtime friends. Doors were shut in my face, in my family's face. My best friend, the one I had spent every week with since my entire childhood, was forbidden to ever see me again. No one could unsay or ignore the words that I had said, what they had heard, what we all finally knew to be true. In the gospel today, those who say they would follow Jesus are then asked to do what seems impossible by Christ. 
Jesus says, if you really want to follow me to Jerusalem, know that it means rejection and maybe being homeless. Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus tells his potential followers that they must be willing to give up their familial traditions and duties. Let the dead bury the dead. Jesus says, once we begin to head toward Jerusalem, there can be no going back. No one who puts their hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Who would ever want to do this? Not me. Not if I had any choice. Not if it ended in the tomb. Where does this leave us? What are we to do exactly? What are we to do? This is one of the points that the Gospel of Luke is asking readers, us listeners, us fans of Jesus today. Do you notice how we never hear those potential followers' replies? Do you notice how Jesus makes these seemingly impossible demands and then they just hang there, waiting to be answered? Not just by the people in the story, but maybe answered by us as well. Are you willing? If following Jesus ended in the tomb, I couldn't follow. I wouldn't go. And yet, I could not stop hearing God's call in my own life to come forward toward my authentic self. I could not say no to the tugging at my heart toward the truth, even if no one else could understand it at the time. If the cost of discipleship only ended in loss, there would be no point. But we know Jesus' story and our story doesn't end in the tomb. Jesus rises from the dead and is always going about doing his Father's business, which, as we know, is bringing new life to our tombs, to our losses, to all of the dead places, to where everything in our lives seems hopeless and beyond saving. We know that we are not just headed toward Jerusalem. No, we know we are heading to the tomb now, but the resurrection is just around the corner. We aren't asked to give up what we know for sure, our present circumstances, without God's promise of new life on the other side waiting for us. Better things are to come. We are an Easter people. Let me say that again. We are an Easter people. We follow Jesus not only on Good Friday, but on Easter Sunday as well. And he is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Hallelujah. So too with us. So too with me. I could not anticipate what my life would be like on the other side of coming out. All I know is that it might cost me everything. But I knew I was being called to live into my truth, into the fullness of life that God had waiting for me on the other side of that grave, on the other side of my fears, on the other side of the lies that I kept telling people about who I was, on the other side of everything that had come before. If I had not come out, I would not be here with you today. If I had not come out, I would never live into the whole person God was calling me to be. If I had not come out, like the psalm today, I would have gone down into the grave and remained there. My shame and my fear would have swallowed me up. I would have taken my own life in that seemingly hopeless place of lying to myself and to the rest of the world. I could have easily done it. And I have known many people who have, and their families. I know many families today who are missing their friends, their children, and their loved ones because their LGBTQ loved ones could not see beyond the tomb. Their families could not see anything beyond the tomb. Their churches could not see anything beyond the tomb. It could have easily have been me, and my family too, facing the tomb with no hope of life on the other side. If I had not walked into the truth of who I was called to be, into the new life I couldn't yet see, if I had not come out, I would not be proclaiming God's good news to you today. Good news for me and for you, for your families and for my family as well, for all of us that our God really is a God of resurrection and life. 
that our God has come to give us new life on the other side of the grave. Not the same life, not in the same measure, but new life, abundant life. Grace upon grace at the last moment and when we most dearly need it, given without merit for you and for me, given to all of us without merit and without measure. Abundant new life, not the same life, but a life we could not anticipate. In closing, let's remember that Easter has finally come and you and I are an Easter people. That is God's promise to each of us. This is God's call to all potential disciples along the road. Are you content to be a fan? Are you happy cheering from the stands? It is for you to answer. Will you follow Jesus? Will you step forward on the road into new life? Please rise. We sing the hymn of the day, Draw Us In the Spirit Together. Four seven. conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. For I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. 
Amen. United in Christ and guided by the Spirit, we pray for the church, the creation, and all in need. God of faithfulness, set the face of your church firmly on you. Rooted in your self-giving love, may the church find freedom in loving our neighbors. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of gentleness, strengthen the earth's ability to heal. Where there are dangerous storms, bring calm. Where there are destructive fires, bring rain. Protect homes, habitats, and livelihoods threatened by climate disasters. O oh God of grace, hear our prayer. And God of peace, guide all who govern that they place the good of their citizens above self-promotion. Anoint leaders of nations with your spirit of neighborly love. Protect refugees and all who live under tyranny or conflict. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of kindness, revealing your healing presence to all who are sick or dying, especially those who we lift to you now aloud or in our hearts, we pray for. Uphold those who grieve, Support the needs of any who are unemployed, hungry, or have nowhere to lay their heads. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of love, attend to those struggling with addiction, depression, or uncontrolled anger. Provide support systems and loving companions as they work toward health, that they may rest in hope and know the fullness of joy in your presence. God of grace, hear our prayer. We give thanks for the faithful departed whose lives proclaimed all you had done for them. At the last Unite us with them as we make our home in you. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of every time and every place, in Jesus' name and filled with your Holy Spirit, we entrust these spoken prayers and those in our hearts into your holy keeping. Amen. You may be seated. In response, we now give our offering. Please rise.
We pray. Gracious God, at all times and in all places, we offer thanksgiving and praise to you through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. It was in the night in which he was betrayed that our Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this to remember me. And again, after the supper, he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant given for you for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We pray the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. We say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. The table is now ready. Come.
body and blood of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Life-giving God, through this meal you have bandaged our wounds and fed us with your mercy. Now send us forth to live for others, both friend and stranger, that all may come to know your love. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. And now may the God of peace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you, comfort you, and show you the, his path all the days of your life. Amen. Our closing song is Just a Closer Walk with Thee, number 697.